this second review video assumes that you've watched the walkthrough of the quiz, and so I'm not going over anything um, that I talked about in the quiz, or if I am, it's going to be not very in-depth. So make sure you watch the quiz video before watching this one. Let's start with double slit interference. So remember the double slit interference equation. All the stuff you need to know is up here on the screen. One big thing, though, that is a concept you need to really understand, that d sine theta indicates the difference in path between uh, waves coming from one slit and the other, so how far the light has to travel from this slit compared to this one, the difference in their length, so if this is x and y, y minus x is given by this right here. If that overall path difference is an integer multiple of wavelength, you get constructive interference. If that overall path difference is a half integer multiple, like 0.5, 1.5, and 2.5, you get destructive interference. So if this whole thing equals 1 times lambda, constructive, 2 times lambda, constructive. If that whole thing equals 0.5, 1.5, etc., lambda, destructive. Although it is given to you on the table of helpful constants, it is just good to carry around in your head that the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Light is a wave like any other, and it obeys the equation V equals lambda F. So if you know the V of, wa of the wave, you can find frequency given lambda or lambda given frequency. All electromagnetic waves have this speed. It's not something we've talked about a lot, but all electromagnetic waves, which go from radio waves, microwaves, x-rays, light, all electromagnetic waves have this speed. So if you're asked a question about the speed or wavelength or frequency of an electromagnetic wave, you solve it just like it's light. Here are the common electromagnetic waves. Uh, a lot of information on this slide about them. Let me help you process through it. So the radiation type or their name, we have radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, which is the colors we see, visible light, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma ray. Notice as we move along this chart, the wavelength gets smaller. So as we go this way, we get a smaller wavelength. If we're getting a smaller wavelength, that also means as we move along this chart, we're getting a higher frequency. So frequency goes up as we move along this chart, as does energy. So with a wave, high energy means high frequency means low wavelength. And you could do it the other way. Low energy means low frequency means high wavelength. And uh, this chart also shows you kind of the size of each wave. Radio waves are the size of buildings, very big. Uh, down to gamma rays, which are the size of atomic nuclei, very, very small wavelengths. You might want to pause and take a second to process through all that. But the key facts right here that you definitely need to know. And all of these waves have the same speed, the speed of light. So 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second also called the speed of light C. Remember from Snell's law that first of all when we measure the angle of incident refracted rays that we measure from a normal line. So this would be theta i if the light is traveling in that direction. Here's theta r for refracted, incident and refracted. Remember that if you go from a slow medium to a fast medium, your Refracted ray will refract farther from the normal in the faster medium. So remember, faster equals farther from the normal line. And also remember that your index of refraction indicates how slow the medium is. So a bigger index of refraction, high index of refraction, means a slow medium. And that means closer to the normal line. So faster equals farther would also equal a small index of refraction. The smaller the index of refraction, the faster the medium. Maybe take a second to process through that slide as well. Also remember that you do always measure incidence with respect to a normal line, so we always have to draw a vector or a line perpendicular to where our ray hits the medium. And so here we would have a zero degree incident angle. That shouldn't say theta equals theta. That should say incident angle equals zero. But then once our light ray made it over to this part, 
we would have to draw our incident angle with respect to a normal line. So we've got to make another 90 degree angle. So we would now have a non-zero incident and we would use that to figure out what our refracted ray would look like. Okay, so just remember always measuring from a normal line. And that question will come up. Maybe take a second to process through that. Details about index for refraction. Remember it's used to compare speeds of light in materials that are not vacuums. For any given material, the speed is constant and you find an index of refraction with n equals c over v, where c is the speed of light in a vacuum. In vacuum and V is the speed of light in the material, so speed of light in material. And for example, the speed of light in water would be 2.25 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Maybe take a second and calculate its index of refraction, just so you make sure you know how to use that equation. Recall that C would be 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second because of the speed of light in a vacuum. And once again, all electromagnetic waves have that speed in a vacuum. Final thing I want to say about waves, remember that frequency is dependent on a source. And so a given wave, once you know its frequency, no matter what happens to that one particular wave, its frequency will stay the same. Now different waves can have different wavelengths, different frequencies, different speed. But once you know one particular wave, its frequency doesn't change, even if it passes from one material to another. Let's move on to a few facts about lenses. Remember convex lenses which often look, well not often, always look like they were cut out of something, like this shape here. Any lens that looks like it was cut out of something is a convex lens, and that can be this kind of shape. That could be this kind of shape. Both of those would be convex and therefore converging. Any lens that looks like something was cut out of it, so that could be like this hourglass shape, or that could even be this shape. Any lens that looks like something was cut out of it is diverging, and it will spread out light rays. So notice that the converging lens up here focuses the light rays to a point. A diverging lens, if we sent light rays into it, would spread them out, meaning that the image would look like if you followed the rule of tracing those back. The image would look like it's somewhere out here, somewhere back here, instead of somewhere up here, like on the converging lens. Something that, if you haven't finished up the conclusion questions from this lab, <coughs> like I told you you should, that you might not know yet, is there's a fun thing that happens if you block out half of this lens. So if we just covered up with our finger half of this lens, just covered it up so that no light was getting through, just blocked it. You might expect, like, oh, does that mean that we lose half the image? No, actually, it just means that we lose half the light rays, which does not mean we lose half the image. It just means that the image becomes half as bright. So if you block half of a lens or even half of a converging mirror, you'll still get your image. It will just be half as bright. It's pretty cool. Um, if you want to borrow some lab equipment and try it, you can. You're welcome to. But just know that if you cover up half a lens or half a converging mirror, your image will simply appear half as bright. You won't lose half the image, it will just be less bright. It's kind of cool, because you're losing half the light, not half the information, because each of these light rays comes from your object and carries all that information, so you're just losing half the light. And therefore, covering up half the lens just makes it dimmer. You need to be familiar with the Bohr model of an atom, which says that electrons orbit in set energy levels around the nucleus doesn't necessarily mean set rings, but it does mean set energy levels. And that whenever their energy levels change, you either emit or absorb a photon. If you decrease in energy levels, you have to emit a photon. If you increase energy levels, so if you were to go up, you would have to absorb a photon. A photon would have to come in and hit you. You may want to take a second and process that slide as well. We can find the energy of a photon Using this equation, the energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times its frequency. Planck's constant would be given to you on your table of helpful constants. We can also then replace frequency with V over lambda, or in the case of light, the speed of light in a vacuum, 
over lambda and emerge with this equation. HC um, is also given to you, but very easy to remember if you just keep track of 1240 EV nanometers. HC is 1240 EV nanometers. You insert the lambda of the photon, you find the energy. Or you could find anything else by solving out that equation. It's helpful to know that this is HF because sometimes you might know the frequency and instead of having to work backwards from here to get the frequency, you just know E equals HF and HC over lambda. You need to know both of those by heart for the multiple choice section and also it'll make your free response a lot easier not having to flip back and forth. Do recall that energies are limited to those transition levels, so I can only move between the set transitions. Um, that shouldn't be called zero at the bottom. Let's say negative 10 electron volts, negative 4 electron volts. I have to absorb exactly 6 electron volts to get from here to here. Remember, if you ever make it to zero, that state is called ionized, and the electron just flies off and says, Woo! I'm free! But the electron leaving is ionization energy, and so this particular atom, if we had an electron in a ground state, the ionization energy would be 10 electron volts, because that's what it would take to get it to zero. And we always set that zero at the ionization state where the electron can leave. This is potential energy, so we can set zero wherever we want. Now that means that all the energy levels inside the atom would be considered negative and then all the outside would be positive. We don't learn about that. We just know that if we can get that electron to zero, it's ionized, it gets to leave the atom. Decay is the most recent thing we did. You need to be able to answer a question like this. Let me correct real fast some of this symbolism, since the, the iPad doesn't like this formatting, 92, and then this would be 207 PB82. Remember, some people will also write it 207 PB82, it's the top and bottom part that matter. You have atomic mass, which is protons plus neutrons, and atomic number, which is just the number of protons. Take a second and try this question. Uh, I'm not going to walk back through what all the types of particles are. We did that so recently, you should remember it. So take a second, answer this question, come back, and I'll just give you the answer. I'm not going to walk you through it. Uh, and then ask somebody if you need help. Okay, hopefully you pause the video. If not, do it now. And here is the correct response. If you need help, ask for help. Do you recall that beta particles are the only thing allowed to change protons only? So a beta particle, if your protons are the only thing that change, you know beta particles were involved. Rutherford was the first person to artificially transmit one element into another, nitrogen to oxygen. I showed you this question um, on Friday. Try this, see if you can remember what the answer is. When you come back, I'll give you the answer. And remember, here is the answer. That was one that did trick people a little bit, because they're like, oh, I didn't know you could just choose proton. But the only thing that can change a atomic mass and atomic number by one at the same time is a proton. And so if you're missing one atomic mass and one atomic number at the same time, something probably happened with a proton in there. Remember that proton could be changed into energy in which case you would use E equals mc squared to solve for the amount of energy left over by that proton. On the AP exam, it's usually given to you in the form of like so much mass, so like maybe 0 0.002 kilograms is missing from an experiment. How much energy do we know was released in that experiment? You just plug in the mass, plug in the speed of light, square the speed of light, and you've got the energy in joules. So this equation will give you energy out in joules. If you need to convert it to electron volts, you'll have to use the conversion factor, which is provided for you on the AP constants sheet. All right, that was our quick and dirty final review. Make sure you watch the quiz video. Make sure you've also watched the video that explains to you the things you need to get out of the plain mirror lab. So many people had trouble with that lab. I don't think I can stress enough how important it is that you watch that video. There are at least three plain mirror questions on the test. And as you know, three questions can be the difference between like a three and a four or a two and a three. See you tomorrow, and good luck.